Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live, a program where we bring you guests from all over the world. Also want to mention that today is the memorial of the Passion of St. John the Baptist, where Herod cut off his head because taken away with lust and with his own perhaps drinking too much, he gave in to a request for the head of John the Baptist that was an act of revenge by his second wife, who, by the way, was also happened to be his niece. And the dancing girl was his grandniece. Another little set of problems St. John would have been critical of. But he died a martyr for the truth of marriage. And he prefigures Christ as his forerunner. And we look to both of those components with good, good insight, perhaps, to be gained by reflecting on his commitment to the truth. Now, tonight, we are going to let the light of Christ shine with our guest, Father Thomas White, a great Dominican priest. Just want to get a quick update first from EWTN Radio's Director of Programming and Production, Mr. Tom Price. Tom, Good welcome. to see you. Good to see you. And what's going on with radio? We're very excited about the, the upcoming EWTN Catholic Radio Conference. This is our 19th annual conference. Mm -hmm. uh, we have it here in Birmingham, November 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's a three-day mm -hmm. affair. Wednesday through Friday, uh, we begin, uh, well, let, me, let me back up a moment. This is for our current affiliates, and there's over 330 of them now in the United States, but it's also for people who are discerning uh, putting on a radio station in their neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. So very exciting for them, an, an opportunity to learn from people mm -hmm. who already have Catholic radio stations on the air. Which are themselves lay run. Absolutely. Do, do any of them belong to a diocese? Uh, very few. It's yes. mainly uh, small groups, groups of five, ten stations, uh, but there are also a lot of singletons where it's just like one couple or one local group that wants to have Catholic radio in, right. their, in their community. And of course, EWTN charges nothing for right. our programming. We don't own those affiliates nope. and we don't charge them, but we want to support them with various kinds of help. Absolutely. So this is, uh, uh, that's why we make the radio signal free and put it out there for people Absolutely. to take. And this is a great way for people to learn the nuts and bolts of not only how to run a Catholic radio station or how to run any station, but also not to lose sight of why you're getting into Catholic radio in the first place. That's why we begin these with a one day retreat in Hansville at the Shrine. Yep. And begin with that, get that grounding, and then it's two days of learning about programming, uh, local programming, how to, how to do a local show, uh, how to do um, promotion of your station, how to do fundraising so you can keep it on the air. There's lots to learn in a short amount of time. People come away from it very rejuvenated, even people who have been in Catholic radio for many years. Yep, yeah, no, I, I've, I've been to some of them. And when you mentioned the nuts and dolts, I thought you were including me as one of the speakers. Uh, no, no, it's different. That'd be me. Yeah. I'm the adult. <laughs> so, again, it's the EW10 Catholic Radio Conference, November 7th to 9th, right here in Birmingham, Alabama. And you can go to EWTNCRC.com for more information. We've got a great website, and our keynote speaker is Dr. Scott Hahn this year. Great. Looking oh, forward good. to it. Yes, very much so. And we're going to be back in a few minutes with our guest, Father Thomas White. Thank you, Tom, for being here with us. Thank and you. we'll see you in just a couple minutes.
Thank you. Welcome back. And we have a guest tonight. He is a theology professor at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., great place right across the street from the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Father converted to the Catholic faith at the age of 22. He acknowledges that some people in society today think of Catholic doctrine and dogma as kind of negative or boring or even insulting. So he set out to enlighten them with a brand new book called The Light of Christ, an introduction to Catholicism. So please welcome Father Thomas J. White, OP, that is a Dominican father. Father White. Thank you so much. Good to have you. Good to be here. Yeah, see, it's good. You have this name White, and you got the white uh, habit. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it wasn't planned that way, but. No, no. From what did you convert to Catholicism? Uh, well, you know, I come from a, a pretty ecumenical family. My mom's from a, a family of Presbyterian missionaries, and my dad's from a Jewish background. Mm -hmm. And um, I got interested in religious questions really more in college mm -hmm. and started reading my way toward becoming Christian and then eventually became Catholic my senior year in college. Okay. And where did you go to school? Uh, I went to Brown University in Rhode Island, sure. very secular ethos and uh, got interested in kind of the history of religious questions, early Christianity, and also look at, uh, looking at other religions. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a central preoccupation of my fellow students, um, so it was a kind of a, an odd interest of mine, but you know, it's it sort of, I think that, that from the beginning to feel a little bit misunderstood, uh, tolerated, but misunderstood, you know, kind of made me aware that uh, making religious decisions can be a difficult thing, and you just have to kind of accept that. And I don't know, it affected me that way to sure. move forward sure. to Catholicism. Yeah, uh, and that was how long ago? Oh, that was 25 years ago or something. Okay. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. So, Catholic. so uh, you know, it's. I think it's important to keep in mind that you know, religious questions are not peripheral. These these are about the core of meaning of life and about what's true and, and good and beautiful, as Augustine and many others have said. And to ignore those questions is not a healthy sign for an individual, yet alone a culture. So I feel really haunted by those questions, and I feel like yeah. I work a lot on secular campuses today uh, as part of the work of this thing called the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C., and it, it seems to me that the, even when you don't have kind of traditional religious theological perspectives on secular campuses, people remain haunted by those big questions. Mm -hmm. They're really inscribed in us. And so uh, connecting people with the great intellectual tradition of the church creates deep encounters between people and God. And yeah. it's really a healthy kind of a wedding of the human spirit's desire to know more about, as you say, you know, the deep truths about reality, beauty, goodness, and then what you find in like the Catholic intellectual tradition. So. Well, it's, this is a, I'm glad you brought up this question before we go into your book. Um, what is this that you do at college campuses? Would you call that? Well, the Thomistic Institute is a, an institute in DC that uh, basically has started uh, college chapters, or you might call them college meeting groups, that students can set up themselves on their campus, and then we, we help them invite in uh, speakers from the Catholic uh, perspective in philosophy, theology, sometimes also literature and, and history and art. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it allows people in, in places like, you know, a, a Yale or a Brown or a MIT to bring in high-level Catholic philosophers and theologians to speak to them about religious viewpoints. and. You know, we find that sometimes there's completely secular students who come to the talks because they're curious and interested. We gave a talk recently, we had a Dominican who's a physicist speak at MIT on uh, does modern physics leave room for free will? And I think there were like 150 students there. Most of them are not, in that case, religious people or they're not maybe sure that they want to be religious, but they're genuinely haunted by the question. They're studying science at the highest level. They're wondering what a human being is. Do we have free will? So, you know, that kind of engagement, what you start to see is how much the, the how, how, how real religious questions can be in people who aren't 
necessarily from the Catholic tradition. Mm. And, you know, we have a lot to say to them if we, if we do it well. And at times there is, a, there can be a certain political pressure to suppress those questions, but the questions do come from within the depth of what it means to be a human being. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the dangers is to see both somewhat inside the church, but especially outside the church, to see the church as primarily political. Of course, I think Catholics should bring their moral views into the political life of the culture. But, of course, the faith is much more and, and in a way much deeper than, you know, merely political stances. And so what we do is we bring in, you know, people to talk about thinkers like Aquinas, which nobody in the, in the secular academy can really contest is an important person. Mm -hmm. And it's often not on subjects that are political, that are more on deeper issues like what is a human being? Do we have free will? Can we know any moral, objectively moral truth, objective moral truth? Is it reasonable to believe in God? Um, what do Catholics believe about the nature of God, mm -hmm. the Holy Trinity? Uh, is it even an intelligible thing? And why is it so? Or mm -hmm. What do Catholics believe about the Eucharist? So we do real theology talks, um, but they're not really, they don't, I, I, I often say they have no political color or odor. And so, but what that does, it invites the student to think about their, like the meaning of their life on a much deeper level than just through a political filter. And of course they can think about the political stuff too, but it comes after. You know, that, so yeah, we right. sort of invite them to a deeper engagement with the, the question of God. And, you know, you hear from some campus, it's not universal, but you hear that sometimes debate is stifled because it, something might be offensive and some people might be, have hurt feelings. Do you find that going on? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I think it, it depends on the topic, but on particular topics, I'd say students and professors live a ve in, on elite campuses now, secular campuses, live a very intellectually regimented life, super ascetical about what you can say or cannot say, what you can talk about or cannot talk about, what views you can express or cannot express. But then there's other domains where, I mean, things are really wide, wide open. And so, for example, what we find our students are absolutely fascinated by and really engaged with the question of uh, the compatibility of Christianity and modern science, mm -hmm. uh, science and religion. I think that is a key question. And th their debate is permitted and things are wide open and you can really engage people. Uh, you can get also, I mean, topics about the rationality of the Bible, belief in the Bible, what it teaches historically, to some extent, especially students who are Christian who are in the secular academy, really want to figure out how to explain the Bible to others. Um, or uh, the mysteries of the faith, you know. Th th sometimes, you know, often young people today, they're just really, even dev devout Catholics, even devout Catholics, haven't really had that much theology formation right. or catechesis. Uh, and so when you actually present them like kind of a real theological perspective, they suddenly realize the church has this theological depth, this intellectual depth. Um, I was, the first time we gave a talk at Harvard, it was to undergraduates, and I was invited to speak on why God became human, Aquinas on the Incarnation. Mm -hmm. So all I did was I took, you know, two articles of the Summa Theologiae, not very long, and presented to these precocious Harvard students who are like 20 years old what Aquinas says as to why God became man. Mm -hmm. And of course he gives all these different arguments. So I kind of went through it with them. And one of these young men looked at me at the end. He said, he's obviously practicing Catholic. He said, okay, I think you were just basically presupposing Christianity is true. And then talking about like the deep wisdom in why God did the things he did. Is that what theology studies? I'm like, yes, that's it. <laughs> you know, and he, he went away thinking, okay, there's actually a lot of amazing content to theology as a sort of science or as a study of revelation. Well, I taught high school, which of course is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes populated with a bunch of little wise guys. And they would say to those of us teaching theology, well, you can't flunk me. I can't flunk God. Uh, this is how you feel. Not in my class, it's not. You yeah. know, it's about thinking through issues of the faith. Yeah, so like the, emot the now the emotivism <laughs> is really present on the campuses. Like everything, you know, everything is subjective. Uh, it depends on how you feel. Uh, the important thing is not to hurt someone else's feelings. Everybody's got a viewpoint. They're all equally invalid or equally valid. And I think, you know, most students realize that that's not, that's, that's kind of a, an un, 
that, tenable. It's untenable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but it, it's still Tell difficult. Than to, a box of rocks is what it is. Yeah. But how do you how do you articulate that you have an absolute absolute view, or that you you hold to absolutes, or you you have convictions, but you also take the human convictions of the other person seriously, mm -hmm. that listening to their emotions matters, etc. So it's a both and strategy for us to show them that we want to. We want to promote truth. We want to also respect persons. We want to love persons, and see why they hold the convictions they do, and so forth. Um, and you know, it's really simple. But I think that that kind of balance, uh, but the idea that, you know, if I don't agree with you, am I trying to destroy you? Well, of course not. Actually, I could be disagreeing with you because I, I think it's the truth that could be helpful to you. But just articulating that that the, the promotion of moral truth is for the good of the other person and can be done in an act of personal care. It's very simple, but I think it's a kind of message that's missing in the kind of politicized culture. Yeah, I, I think um, too that it's something I've been talking a lot about over the years of teaching on this program and the other programs, that if you have a relativistic point of view and that everybody has their own truth. There's no basis for dialogue. And what you're talking about is using reason as a way to establish a common discourse so we can engage each other. Yeah, Whereas I mean, yeah. if it's, the truth is subjective, everybody has to isolate. Yeah, and I think that resonates with students, really, frankly. I think especially younger students, they, they actually realize it's, it's it's almost like we've moved out of the age of relativism and towards the age of a new secular dogmatism. And they're getting a lot of dogmas uh, pressed down on them. I mean, they're, they're not Catholic teachings. They're, they're no. the secular uh, list. And I think a lot of them feel like, well, I, OK, I think some of these things are true. Some of these things are, are maybe not true. Some of them are questionable. But how do, I, how do I make judgments about it? How do I begin to have a moral a compass? Uh, and there's, there's often not a lot taught to them on, on that level. Or it might be taught to them like, well, here's one person's opinion, another person's opinion, another person's opinion. Well, that's normal. They have to compare opinions. But they often find they don't find, they don't have a sense of resolution. Yeah, well, they don't have the tools of logic by which they can analyze the different positions and see what makes more sense. That's oftentimes missing. And the, the other thing, too, I, I am concerned with, uh, with relativism is that the only resolution becomes might makes right. If I can yell you into silence or intimidate you, then you can't argue with me because I have the moral upper hand through my anger and outrage. That's common enough. And uh, I, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, and the other thing is that what's correct is very fluid. It yeah. changes from one short period to another because it's not always acceptable. It's based on cultural trends. And yep. the students see that. And a lot of or professors. fads. Yeah, fads. And a lot of the professors see it too, to be fair. I mean, I. They're, they're a little worried about where the, the, you know, how do they, you know, navigate what could be changing political winds. Um, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people in the academy, uh, in the secular academy, who are actually friendly interlocutors uh, who care about the truth. And we have found also there's a lot of Catholic professors or Christian professors who are often a little bit isolated, very brilliant, and they want to have conversations uh, with like-minded uh, colleagues, and so we help create conferences and strategies for them to mm -hmm. to engage with others, and also for their students to maybe do programs with them that are more on the the Catholic tradition, the Catholic intellectual mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, we've seen people convert to Catholicism. We've seen people enter religious life, or the priestly, our seminary, or enter uh, women's religious life. So I don't know. There's been a lot of. Um, encouraging signs where you see that like even in places where we think we might not get a hearing actually there can be a pretty deep sympathy for the faith you know so well, one of the things I also like about this is you're going back to certain early roots of the Dominican order uh, y'all didn't start the University of 
Paris. But you went in there like gangbusters with great thinkers like St. Thomas and others. Yeah. So and it's, a great, it's a great distinction, actually, between Jesuits and, and Dominicans, because the Jesuits have famously often founded and run universities and, uh, you know, created an amazing private university system. Um, but Dominicans always, from the beginning, set up priories next to existing universities. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, 12, 16, and so forth, uh, uh, Dominic sent the, the, the men, even when they were a very small congregation, out to the major new universities. Uh, so, uh, preaching in the universities, trying to promote the theological wisdom in the, in the universities, engaging with the philosophy of the day. And Thomas Aquinas was, of course, central to that. But also, I mean, his thought remains, I think, central. It's a, mm -hmm. he's a, he remains, I think, deeply insightful for understanding a lot, a great deal about what real, the nature of reality, what a human being is, how we can know God. So he's a tremendous resource for us, I think, even right now, to uh, engage in, in the university. And in, when you look at the history of the church since St. Thomas, and just the other day we celebrated St. Augustine, he did dominate thought from the fourth century until St. Thomas. And then St. Thomas developed a new synthesis based on Aristotle and Augustine and all the fathers. And when you look at the history since, those periods when Thomas's thought is disregarded tend to be times of great confusion. Well, I father, think, father is a great Jesuit. He's speaking right to my Dominican heart here. This is great. Yes, yes. Well, when your Dominican heart is that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's, but you, you, you see in the four, 14th century this decline into a Averroes and moving away from Thomas, rejecting Thomas by, you know, William of Ockham and others, uh, Marcellus of Padua. And then the rediscovery in the 16th century, it was key for the Jesuits, mm -hmm. absolutely key. Yeah, yeah, the, at, Spanish, at the, the Spanish, Southern Spanish renewal. I mean, I think, you know, for Dominicans, and I, I can hear Father's Jesuit training is um, lucidly describing a similar view. Uh, you know, there's two kind of great um, errors that ar arise in modernity, sp generally speaking. And one is what we would call fideism, where it's sort of the idea that to, uh, acknowledge the greatness of faith and supernatural gifts of knowledge of God, we have to diminish reason or show the, the limits and frailty of reason. So we diminish philosophy to augment theology or we diminish human reason to augment the authority of the church. And the other side is a kind of rationalism that reacts, that says no, human reason can suffice to itself. Revelation diminishes us rationally. Right. The more we depend on revelation and authority of the church, the more intellectually childlike we become and uh, you know, th the less responsible we are intellectually. So we need to question everything and in fact throw out the faith if we want to be you know, intellectual grown-ups, intellectually responsible people. And that's you know, obviously kind of a trend in the Enlightenment, deeply present. So you know, the, the first Vatican Council in the 19th century recalls the balance which comes from Aquinas that, and from the great tradition of the scholastics that our reason can reach out to God and see that God exists and acknowledge its own openness to revelation. It's like reasonable right. to want to know God more perfectly than we know Him just by natural reason. If revelation exists, if it's real, it's reasonable to want to know God in Himself, revealing Himself to me. And at the same time, revelation is a gratuitous gift. It's from beyond the scope of reason, mm. uh, our natural reason. And revelation is like a higher enlightenment. Uh, so there's a deep complementarity between na the natural, rational search for God and understanding and revelation of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we need to see how faith and reason interplay and build, work. They're not contradictory. I think that's why I like what you're doing with science and religion. That's another... Well, that's the, that's, in the the modern world. that's the big lie. That's the big story that's out there from the other side, from the new atheists, that the more you study science, the more you see that religion's untenable. The more you study science, the more you see the Bible can't be inspired. The more you study science, the more you have to give up on religious understandings of reality. That's, that's the big true. lie. It's false. And it needs to be, but it needs to be encountered critically 
And so we bring in a lot of you know, top level scientists, philosophers of science, uh, and theologians who are scientifically literate to talk about that in the heart of these campuses to students who are in the scientific guild at MIT or Harvard and whatnot to, to kind of present to them uh, how, to, how to understand the compatibility so that they can become agents of change in the, in the culture uh, itself of academic science and of, of philosophy. I, I'm later on in the year going to have a, a priest who's written a wonderful book on the history of priests and religious who have been involved in tremendous science. I mean, our Jesuit forefathers and Dominican forefathers in the 17th century were the ones who came up with the concepts that are the basis of capitalism that Adam Smith just merely pulled together and put into English. But it was the work of our earlier Jesuit and Dominican uh, fathers in um, Spain who came up with these basic concepts. Most people have no idea of that, yet alone the Big Bang Theory by Father Lemaitre and many others. You know, So this, the, the church loves science uh, and we have to see that we don't want to have dumb science or w more importantly, we don't want immoral science. The church never contests scientific discovery. She only contests the moral uses of science. So the church is, has reservations about the moral uses of science. If anyone doesn't have problems with the use of the atomic bomb as a way of exterminating human life, then they have a problem, not the church. Right. It's the use of science that we need to be concerned about. And that's different from the, uh, being open to scientific discovery and exploration. Right, right. You know, I mean, everybody, I, I hope, would agree that the pseudo-scientific research of Joseph Mengele in the concentration camps was immoral inherently. Right, there's ways of proceeding in scientific Anybody experimentation that are morally un, un, unacceptable. And I mean, any, I think every, almost every scientist will concede that. And we want to have an engagement with the role of morality and faith in the pursuit of good experimentation. That's all that we want to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing that you're going to campus. Mm -hmm. But there's another good thing going on. We've got to take a break. We'll be back in about two minutes because we want to give you an opportunity to ask Father about some of the work that he's doing and these issues that he has. So please stay with us. Welcome back to all of you, and Father, are you ready for some questions? Indeed, that's great. That's what we expect from Dominicans. Quite, that's St. Thomas, he scheduled, he organized his book around questions. He was good at that. And answers. Yeah, he was especially good at that. Yes. So let's start with John. John, how are you doing? Very good, Father Mitch. How are you today? Fine, thank you. What's your question? My question for Father Thomas is, uh, you're very good. You're just the right person to speak to college students. For the inquiring students, uh, what do you, what have you found to be the most important things that people of that age need to know about Jesus Christ personally and his divinity and humanity? Thank you. All right. Father? It's a great question. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the th I'll, t I'll start by just briefly telling you the questions they typically have. 
The most typical kind of questions you see in college students in the secular domain, I think, today are, um, can we really trust the gospel portraits of Christ historically? Ought we to think that the historical Jesus is someone different than the Christ of the church? I mean, mm -hmm. they kind of you could call it, to put it in a kind of crude terms, the Da Vinci Code suspicion. So we have a yes. series of talks about that to kind yes. of give people uh, uh, information for how to uh, think about the fact that the Gospels do give us real historical vision of the of the actual historical Jesus. Another issue is, I mean, they're curious about what we really understand about the atonement. I think people don't really understand what it means to say that Jesus died for our sins. I mean, just intellectually, why is that saving that Christ should die and suffer for us? And so to like, really look at like what Anselm and Aquinas and other great thinkers see, teach about that is helpful. And a third thing that's very much on their minds is uh, the, 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 you might call it the problem of religious pluralism or diverse religions. If Christ really is God made man and universal savior, what does that say about other religions or how do we understand partial truths of other mm. religions, Catholicism and other religions? I mean, how do I negotiate in a concrete way living with people who might be Muslim or Jewish or uh, from other religious traditions, or if I non-religious, or non-religious, and and to, to don't acknowledge any kind of faith, if I if I think Christ is somehow connected to them as Savior, how is that not exclusive? Okay, it's a normal contemporary concern. I think on a kind of practical level, what a lot of them need actually is to discover Christ uh, in in a life of prayer. Um, you know, the Kara studies show that uh, Catholics in particular, but young Christians in our country in general often have no sense of a religious experience of Christ. And so I think often what they need is to encounter Christ in the Eucharist, in adoration, uh, to develop a prayer life, a discipline, a regimen of prayer life. They'll, they'll discipline themselves to study, you know, calculus or a difficult text of uh, Shakespeare or Spencer or whatever, but to, what about spending like 20 minutes a day in prayer and actually just or half an hour and learning to read the scriptures prayerfully? You know, so I think often they need to discover like the interior discipline of how to engage with Christ as a person and then to see that the dogmas have kind of a, a real kind of depth to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a kind of all that stuff at once and you, you sort of start where what the student's interested in. So I mean, certainly as, as, as a corollary to some of this, I've heard students say, well, uh, is Jesus a, an historical figure? Is there any evidence for him outside the Gospels and things like that? Those are, they want to know if it's true. I think that's the underlying yeah. question. Is this true? Or if it's a myth, I don't want anything to do with it. That's right. And how do you show it's not a myth, which it isn't? So, right. you know, we, we have some, we, you know, we, we send in people who are, you know, devout scripture scholars who are have heard all the objections and, and, and thought about that, wrestled with it, written on it, and give, and give them presentations on that. And I think it, it's very helpful to them to see, again, the compatibility of faith and reason, historical analysis and rational historical analysis and, and uh, supernatural faith. I often point out that the word mythos, usually in the plural mythoi, uh, is five times in the uh, New Testament. Every time, it's always something that's rejected, that we don't want myths, we want truth. Sir, what can we do for you this fine evening? Well, I have a question for Father White. Yep. Um, that perhaps he can elaborate a little bit on the uh, relevance of Thomism today in evangelizing those outside the church, and then maybe talk a little bit about Thomism before the council with perhaps you know, Pope Leo XIII, the, the manualists, and then what you had after the council and then kind of what we have today and, and how that would be relevant for the church today. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Those are great questions. Um, oh, sorry, the first one was? Oh, the relevance of evangelizing those outside the church with uh, yeah, to mystic I, theology. I mean, I, I think, you know, Aquin Aquinas is, I, well, I like to say, that we often think as Catholics the key battle is in the heart, that the heart surrendered to God and His grace. And of course the heart is really important. Mm -hmm. But in our own era, a lot of the battle is also in the mind, and people are genuinely confused about the nature of reality, they're perplexed, they're often, I'd say, somewhat innocently agnostic, they're trying to figure out what the state of the world is. And Aquinas gives you a lot there uh, in terms of thinking about creation, I'd say, first and foremost. Most of us think, if we think about creation, we might instinctively think about creation as um, 
the, the, the first moment in which God gave the world existence or the Big Bang. But Aquinas thinks the creation is something that's at the, the roots of everything happening now, that God is giving being to all that is now, and that the, the, uh, the dependency of you and I and every other thing that exists, our dependency on others for our very existence, shows we're not first in reality and we depend on one who sustains us in being. So Aquinas has this really deep, sort of, you might call it spirituality of the creation, that the beauty of all things, the goodness of all things, the existence of all things points us towards a hidden mystery of God who's more intimate to us than we are to ourselves, as Augustine says and Aquinas reflects on. You know, so this is like kind of deep sense of the presence of God just on a rational level, sustaining things in being, being closer to me than I am to myself. And that's a kind of very great deep view that I, help, I think helps a lot of people. Also, Aquinas has a great vision of human freedom as freedom for happiness and moral ec excellence. So when he talks about morality, I mean Aquinas thinks laws and rules matter, but they're more like the kind of guides to help you see what you should do and should never do to arrive at a state of life that's happy. Now it's ascetical, maybe, you know, marital fidelity involves asceticism, for example, but it's also a kind of pathway toward happiness. And so, like, the disciplines of the soul are meant to allow us to flourish, to become people who have a happy inner life and joy of living with God. So Aquinas has got a great view of freedom. Uh, and then Aquinas has a beautiful view of the sacraments, that we need sensible signs of grace because we are rational animals. We're not just animals, we're also spiritual, but we're not just spirits, we're also animals. And so we can't just be spiritual and not religious. We also need to be physically religious because we need rites and rituals and a sense of mystery enshrined in ceremonies and God has given us the sacraments fittingly so that as these sensate animals we can engage with the mystery of God in a tangible, visible, sensible way. And so Aquinas talks about each of the sacraments in very deep, beautiful ways. So those are just some ideas, you know, the mystery of creation, the sort of spirituality of creation, the mystery of human freedom and flourishing through, you know, moral, a moral project of excellence and kind of the spirituality of the sacraments. So those are just some examples. Now, your second question is a more uh, historical question about Thomism before the Council, after the Council, and today. Um, this could be said, I think, kind of in a, in a sort of succinct way this way. Okay. Leo XIII is Pope in the end of the 19th century. He's seeing the great rise of secularism. And he calls on theologians and philosophers to make use of St. Thomas to respond to the great crisis of secularism in our modern era. Return to Aquinas, look at reality as Aquinas sees it in its depths, as a reality open to God, uh, see how good philosophy and theology lead us to acknowledge God. And we can do that in, in the modern world without any kind of anti-modern complexes, we can be happy, modern Catholic people. And that project went on for a long time, and there were great strides made in modern research in Aquinas and Catholic philosophy before the Council. After the Second Vatican Council, there was a kind of counter-movement where the, the fear was that Thomism and scholasticism have made us too narrow. They've given us too many rote answers, ready-made answers, and we need to open things up and have a broader philosophy greater freedom of exploration. The problem was, I mean, of course, open-mindedness and exploration are necessary, but the problem was often there wasn't enough formation in the 70s and 80s in a solid philosophical foundation in like the great tradition. And so what you got was a kind of intellectual dilettantism or kind of superficial formation in the seminaries and in theology faculties where people, they studied this, they studied that, they studied what was uh, uh, you know, trendy, but they didn't necessarily get deep roots. And of course, you know, things didn't change. Yeah, I lived that, yeah. uh, you know, very much. Uh, when I was, I started uh, theology in 74. And the canon of acceptability, you know, the, uh, in terms of the books that were acceptable for us to read, were books written after the council. Yeah. That was, you know, nine years earlier. Now, that wasn't healthy, and the rejection of things before the council, as if there was this break, I think, affected not just 
were the guys I studied with, but seminaries around the country. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't healthy. Sure, it led to a great crisis. Yep. Now, I think the irony is, actually today with the kind of postmodernism where everything seems relative and students are kind of trying to figure out how to get a, a grasp of the whole, they're often going through university, they're taking a class in Spanish literature and archaeology and uh, modern, you know, science and calculus and maybe, uh, you know, the philosophy of the Enlightenment. It's all jumbled up. They don't have a synthesis. No. The school doesn't provide a synthesis. It provides maybe many excellent courses and many excellent professors, but no unifying view. Right. And so when they actually study Aquinas and they see that he has this kind of unified understanding of learning in light of a deep philosophy about being, about human nature, about the nature of natural realities, etc. And they see that science is compatible with philosophy and philosophy is compatible with theology. There's a kind of healing of the mind because yep. they start to see things, there's a kind of unity. Right. And so I think actually Aquinas has this kind of really apropos, he's like, he's coming back into style among young people. Yeah. It's really great. And we have another question. What can we do for you, Noah? Yes. Um, Father, you wrote an article in First Things called Catholicism in an Age of Discontent in 2016. And then this book came out afterwards called The Light of Christ, an Introduction to Catholicism. One can't help but notice it seems to be calling to mind the one Ratzinger wrote in 1968 called Introduction to Catholicism. How does this book a response to your article, and how does it reflect Ratzinger, another great mind, uh, dealing with our times? Well, thank you. That's a very perceptive question. The article was actually kind of sketch of the book, so you're right on the mark there. And it was a, the book is an attempt to explain the fundamentals of the Catholic faith, both in its doctrine and its moral teachings, to kind of a contemporary audience of, you might say, non-specialists. I wrote it for like 20-something-year-old lawyers who often come see me in Washington, D.C. Maybe they grew up in the Protestant tradition. Maybe they're a lapsed Catholic. Uh, maybe they're just a seeker and they're kind of looking for perspective, how to understand Catholicism. And um, so the book is written to kind of int introduce Catholicism to people uh, at an intellectual but accessible level. And it does have a little echo, a little tip of the hat to Joseph Ratzinger's book, uh, Introduction to Christianity. It's a, it's a less technical or maybe a less sophisticated book, purposefully written at a lower level than Joseph Ratzinger's book. That book that he wrote in 1968, I believe, comes from a course of theology, which was really an introduction to Catholic theology. And it says it's an introduction, and it should be read by everybody. It's a, it's a fascinating book, but it's also a very difficult book. And I was trying to write something that was a little bit more on the level of something like Frank Sheed's Theology and Sanity, that's sort of written to give a, a, a philosophical, theological overview of Catholicism that's more accessible. And kind of an introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An updated, you know, I take on the questions of like the historical Jesus and, you know, science and religion sort of things that people ask about today, right. uh, the controversial, all the controversial moral teachings of the Catholic Church. So how do you talk to people about those things and what do we believe? Um, I'm happy to say that the book has seemed to help a lot of people uh, who are preparing to enter the church. So. Good, good. You have another caller. Hello, Tony. Hi, Father. Hi, where uh, are you calling fathers. from? Um, Thank you for the wonderful conversation that you're having. The, the show is terrific over the years, uh, great people and great uh, conversations. Thank but you. Uh, my question is that with many of the colleges and universities being left-leaning uh, uh, in everything that goes on there, what can he suggest for us as parents or grandparents to keep our kids grounded in the faith so that they don't lose their faith coming out of school? Excellent question. I think a lot of parents agonize over this question. I have this conversation with people uh, all the time, and I don't think there's any silver bullet, so to speak, about how to encourage your own son or daughter to practice the faith avidly and grow in their faith intellectually. However, there are resources. So one of the resources is uh, to look carefully at the state of the chaplaincy at a college campus. If the student mm -hmm. doesn't want to go to Mass or engage with the chaplaincy, you can't do very much about that. But if they want to go to the chaplaincy and the chaplaincy is healthy and there's a real life of faith and adoration and hopefully an intellectual program, then you're also going to um, you have a very good chance of them making it through and start actually growing in their faith. Focus missionaries provide a tremendous resource at many campuses. The Thomistic Institute's now at, I think, about 40 campuses and growing. 
and we're actually interested in being at new campuses, so people should contact the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C. A lot of times when undergraduates themselves found a chapter at their school, they help other people, but they also grow in their own kind of commitment intellectually to the faith. There's also more online resources now intellectually for people. Um, we put up all, all our talks are on, on podcasts at SoundCloud. Uh, if, you re, if you Google SoundCloud and Thomistic Institute, you'll find all our podcasts. I think those are widely shared, and I think a lot of students listen to them. So they, there's kind of, you might call it, para-institutional intellectual resources. Uh, so I think those things are all significant, but there's no pure substitute for having professors on campus who have deep Catholic convictions and can help the students grow in their Catholic intellectual life. So, you know, the best thing is to find where are there, not necessarily just chaplains, but professors who are convicted and to help develop, you know, help support those schools. I think it's important. And I think also to work with your children while they're still in high school by sophomore, junior, especially junior year, to let them know they will be challenged about their faith and they need to be able to have a response. And again, it's not a silver bullet. There are lots of issues that go on, but it's something that uh, we, we have to take a look at, uh, you know, preparing them for that as a battle and ask them when your faith is challenged, not if, but when your faith is challenged, are you going to wimp out or are you going to do something about it? And I would like to use it in that kind of way just because some kids need a little bit of a challenge, um, you know, just to if the, And if the parents are studying the faith, if the parents are doing stuff with their minds and studying the faith and talking about it at the dinner table, it influences the child. Yep. And high school is pretty important. If the student really gets in sophomore, junior year, a kind of intellectual habit of kind of questioning and finding answers intellectually, they're going to do a lot better in college. If they think their father Absolutely. and their mother, I would say their father and their mother, but maybe especially their father, yep. really believes the faith intellectually and is sort of engaged in it, they're a lot more likely to basically imitate them. Right. We have Mike. Mike, where are you calling from? Chicago. North side or south side? South side. God bless you. And what, 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 what can we do for you this evening? Well, Father's, um, Father White mentioned that he was involved in a discussion about free will. So my question is, how can those that hold that there is no free will, how could they hold that position when they don't have a free will to come to that conclusion? <laughs> yeah, well, that, now this is yeah. a man that thinks yeah. logically. Yeah, yeah, well, there's performative, that's what we Must call not. performative contradiction, right? I mean, the guy argues that there's no free will, and then he goes right out to the grocery store and he buys orange juice. So, and he chooses that rather than apple juice. So the thing is, on a performative level, I think a, a lot of people who are skeptics about free will recognize that there's a practical level on which, in your practical intellect, you're always using it. But what we call free will, they might call a folklore concept. And that deep down, when you examine the structures of the brain and the material causality, the material constitution of the human being, you're going to see, if we know enough about the brain, about modern physics, we'll be able to dissolve all that down to, uh, you know, the, the firing off of the atoms in, in, in the, in the uh, frontal lobe and so forth. So they're materialists. So you have to go, I mean, typically, not always, but usually that's where the, the, the worry is on people who think free will, free will is a kind of a, you know, word we use for some process of desires that really come from our animality, that really come from our materiality, that really come from laws of physics. So you have to really question whether that we can know things outside of the world of modern science. You know, I mean, okay, we have knowledge of the human body through physics, biology, chemistry. But are there other ways of knowing? Okay, so are we positivists who just believe in the sciences as the only way of knowing? Are there real philosophical and common sense venues, ways of knowing the human being? Uh, and then from those, can we begin to see that human beings have features that are not merely explicable by our material processes? Can we think about human knowledge, universal knowledge, human abstraction, the way we use language, the way we can create art? Numbers. Numbers, yeah, numeric abstraction. Yeah. And therefore also science itself is a sign of something else in us that's not material and free will. And the way that free will actually presupposes uh, universal deliberative knowledge, that's Thomas Aquinas there, that because we can think in universal abstract terms, we can make free decisions. We're not bound just by the desires of our senses or the movements of our 
animal psychology, but we can actually rise above that and reflect and think rationally in universal terms and choose in universal terms. Okay, that's a big philosophical argument. It's not easy to make. You have to have somebody who's patient, who's willing to engage honestly. And some people use the kind of science appeal more as a defense of skepticism so that they don't really have to engage with the truth. Uh, some of them actually are honestly materialistic. And they might engage with this and, and be open to a real discussion to think there's more to the human being than just matter and physics. Yep. Um, and real quick uh, question that we had. Is there a manual to Thomas or some sort of a introduction to Thomas that would help the layperson who's just trying to get started uh, with Thomas? Anything we, uh, well, my good friend Edward Fazer is going to be thankful to me that I'm giving him a plug on the television. But I think Ed Fazer, it's F-E-S-E-R. His, his book Aquinas for Beginners is a really great place to start. He's and, been a guest on the show yeah, here. Yeah, okay. So, so Ed's work is very know. helpful. Yep. I, I, I would concur with that. So yeah, Edward, Dr. Edward Fazer. And again, Father uh, Thomas White's book is called The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism. This is available at EWTNRC.com, and it is uh, number 29, or 713, the I think it is. But it's The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism. Urge you to get that. Well, Father, you know, this goes by much too quickly, but uh, we've got a lot covered. I appreciate you coming all the way from Washington over here. Thank you very much. Father Mitch, I'm very honored to be here. It's great, and thank you for all the great work you all do. Well, we love, we love doing it, that's for sure. And if you would join me in giving a blessing to our audience, may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by His peace. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just to remind you that we can bring Father here and all of our other guests and our other programs only because the network is brought to you by you. Mother was inspired to have you be the ones who make this network keep going by your donations. So keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. God bless.